Welcome everybody to one of our uh, seminars here in CFT. Today we have the pleasure of having Yuri Volchit. So uh, Yuri uh, did his PhD in the University of Auckland in 2017. Then he did a postdoc in uh, Ben Gurion University of Negev in Israel. Then he became an assistant professor also in the Department of Mathematics in the Texas A&M University in the United States. Then he came back into Europe to do a postdoc in the University of Copenhagen, finally to become an assistant professor in the University of Drexel, Pennsylvania. So uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation, Yuri, and this screen is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, both for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, I have to say it's it's a uh, it's a first time I give this kind of a talk in the sense that well I'm a mathematician um, I guess algebraist um, so usually either I talk about math to mathematicians or I talk math to physicists physicists and this time it's uh, probably the most physicsy well I mean talk that I'm giving to you know to to people that know this kind of stuff. So I will focus probably more on, on mathy part. Okay. Um, but yeah, as I mean, as title says, I'll, I'll be talking about self-testing and in particular about constant sized self-tests, meaning that um, the number of inputs and outputs are gonna be fixed for certain infinite families of, of quantum states and, and measurements. Um, so, I'll start with an introduction, which, you know, I'll keep it as, simplified, as simple as possible. That's also for my benefit. And then maybe I'm going to focus a little bit more on, on three and four, how what kind of math plays into, into the results that I'm going to be talking about. Um, the, the, the scenario that I want to keep for this talk, it's, it's, uh, it's probably the, the, the simplest and the most uh, standard scenario, namely bipartite bell scenario. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have two parties or two devices. Each of them have some inputs, some outputs, and um, they are not supposed to communicate, um, but they will share um, some entanglement. Um, now, classically, what would be this picture? Well, um, uh, how, how, I should, how I'm going to think about it is that, well, you have M inputs for one party and inputs for the other party. This can be different number of inputs. Um, and then for each input, you can have several outputs. Um, most of the time, I'm going to have the same number of, of outputs for every input, but I mean, they could, they could be different. Um, now, classically, if, if I would have some shared classical randomness between two, I don't know, uh, uh, some unknown, unknown, um, Oh, well, not unknown, but some some randomized event that um, both devices can observe or something like that. Well, then how do how is this being modeled? Well, you have you you describe that shared randomness with some probability space, um, and then each of the what 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 the devices do is well regarding on on i and and regarding on what what's being observed with some probability is going to give you out some output. Um, Maybe I'm here, I'm already simplifying certain things. You see that I'm taking this, I'm essentially modeling, modeling um, measurements with, with zero, one values, right? Uh, I, could, I, could, uh, I could take this a little bit more generally to take values between, all the values between zero and one. Anyway, it's a little bit already simplifying, but that's simply to, to keep, uh, to, to, to not, to not have too many definitions later on. And then, okay, that's how we compute the, the probability that, um, that the, let's say, devices answer A and B, provided that the input were I and J. So this is classical picture. And then once, once you, you start allowing to have um, quantum sources of randomness, so let's say some shared source of, of, of entanglement, some, I guess, photons shooting left and right, um, then one can model this like the like, like the following. So the the, the 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 source of entanglement is represented by a quantum state, and then measurements. At least in what I'm going to talk today, I'm going to present them with projections. Again, this is not the most general picture, right? I could think of um, 
positive semi-definite operators instead of projections. And that's a very valid point when, when you think about self-testing. Um, some of the present audience has results on self-testing positive semi-definite, uh, so um, POVMs instead of PVMs. Again, for simplicity, I'll stick with, with projections. Um, and the other thing for simplicity, I'm, I'm, stick, I'm sticking with pure quantum state. So, so for me, quantum state, at least for today, it's gonna be it's gonna be a unit vector in a Hilbert space. So I have a bunch of projections for one party, a bunch of projections for the other party. For for each input of the third party, I have as many projections as I can have output for that part for that input, and those projections add up to identity. Um, because well, I mean, on I, I, the, the machine is going to just output one of them, so that's what okay, it adds up to identity. Um, and then here, quantum mechanics comes in that tells us that, or rather, um, it's a rule in quantum mechanics that well, was the probability that the machines, the first machine answers A and the second one B, um, under the assumption that the inputs were I and J. Well, Born rule tells us the Born rule tells. Uh, how how this is how this probability is being computed. You take the inner product of this of the state of the unit vector with the tensor product between projections, right? And this tensor product is standing there to 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 tell me that there's no communication, right, between the the devices. Okay. So so this is going to be the setup. So so this is this is uh, this is um, how I'll describe my bar pi type. Um, so, so, I mean, bipartite scenario having two parties um, entangled, and now uh, having these projections for one and the other in state. That's what I'm going to call a model for for this scenario. So, um, if I now, you know, try to strip out interpretation away and, and go to um, safety of mathematics. So, what am I going to call a quantum model for a? So, what do I mean by this parenthesis k one to k m l one to l n bipartite scenario? Um, I'll, I mean, it looks cumbersome notation, but I want to say that first party has M inputs. The first input can have K1 answers, the second one K2 answers, and so on. And then uh, L1 to L and the similar information for the second party. So what's a what, a, what does a model consist, uh, consist of? Well, um, two Hilbert spaces, one for party first party, one for the other party. Hilbert spaces, um, in in my talk, they are mostly going to be tiny dimensional. So you know, think of c to the d or something like that. Um, the the state which lies in the tensor product of both it's and and again, I'm go only going to focus on pure state. So so unit vector uh, in H A tensor H B uh, that's mostly going to be entangled. Um, and then this this project. So for each input, I have a bunch of projections that add up to identity. That's called a PVM, so projective valued measure. So I have for each input for each of the parties, I have I have a um, projective value measure. So again, it's a it's a it's a bunch of projections that add up to identity. So that's that's how we describe. I mean, that, that's how we describe what's happening inside that you have uh, these projections in a state now. What what what's the classical thing that comes out of this scenario, right? So uh, well, what's classical? Uh, let's say uniformly, um, you're plugging in you you're plugging in inputs and then you're uh, counting uh, and then you're recording the outputs and you do that uh, you know a few million times and then you record the statistics. So that's the classical thing that you get out of the out of um, out of a Bell scenario. And um, so as we saw, the statistics, the probability of, of these uh, outcomes subject to what, what, you, what you put in is recorded by these numbers, by these inner products of the state Psi with the, with the tensor product of these projections. Now, you can think of collecting all these numbers into a, into a big array, four-dimensional array, right? Indexed by all possible inputs for both parties and all possible outputs. And, um, I'm good. So this this array is called the correlation or correlations of the model. I never know if you if if one is supposed to use this as a, as a singular or plural. I'm going to denote this array as C n um, 
which I also don't think is a standard notation, but simply CM is my correlation of the model, right? So, so this is the, the classical thing that we that we observe from 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 the from the from these two devices. Okay, so that's my setup. Now, what what I'm going to talk about is and and well, what what self testing is about is well, can the correlation determine the model, right? I mean, um, right? Uh, especially I'm a, I'm a mathematician. I don't know anything about physics, you know. And and now you you throw at me two black boxes and you say, oh, they are entangled, and then something's happening inside. I mean, I don't know what's happening inside, right? And then I start pressing some things and recording stuff out. And let's say that I'm I collect all these statistics. Can I use this statistics so that the correlations, uh, the classical data, can I use that to actually figure out what's happening within the devices? What are what are the measurements? What are the projections? And what's the state? Now, um, of course, I mean it can't correlation can't completely determine the model because there are some natural things that you can do to a model that are going to give you the same correlation. Um, and I'm going to collect those things in the following definition. I'll, I'll, I'll first say definition and, and then comment on this. So um, if I have two quantum models, M and M tilde, um, then I'm going to say that M tilde is a local dilation of M if, if I have two auxiliary Hilbert spaces, the one that I write with prime, and I have two isometries from, from, from Hilbert spaces from, um, from, for, the, for the model M, to the one with M tilde tensor, these auxiliary uh, Hilbert spaces, and an auxiliary state in this auxiliary uh, Hilbert spaces such that such that the following holds. So maybe if I if I put apart this definition, what's the point? So it's kind of a I take I take I take M I can make it into in, I can I can make this Hilbert space bigger for a trivial reason to just trivially enlarge. The, my state by tensoring with another state, I think this is called ancilla. Um, and, and then I ask that my, 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 my projections act, act trivially on it. So that's why I have here this projection tensor identity, right? So this tensor identity tells you that, oh, on this extension, the, the, my, my, my measurements act trivially. And then at the end, I can also change basis uh, locally. What does that mean? I can change basis on the, on the first party and on the second party. Um, separately, right? And then is this is this the same as as M, right? So I think the original so, so okay. And, and what's the point? Well, the point is these operations. So um, amplifying the, the the model and then changing a basis, local basis. This does not change correlations, right? If if this equation holds and I start computing, oh, what are those inner products? They are not going to change. Inner products are not going to detect this. Uh, auxiliary state and this enlargement, and they won't register that I change the basis. Right? So correlations stay the same. Um, and we're going to take them as a definition that model is self-tested by its correlation, is essentially determined by its correlation, if it's local dilation of any other model that would have the same correlation. So um, this is well, not exactly this definition, but this is um, the, 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 this is what we call self-testing. Um, definition was, I mean, the, 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 the terminology that the self-testing was first introduced by Myers and Yao in 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 04. Uh, I guess at that time it was a little bit different definition, but uh, it was along the lines of well, yes, um, the the correlations won't change if I uh, up to up to local unitaries and up to ampliations. Um, so we can't distinguish those models. But if that's the only only thing that gives you the same correlations, well, then the then the model is self-testing. Um, this concrete definition that I took is 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 from a paper of of Laura Manchinska and and co-authors. Um, again, I'm also not saying that they were they were the ones that did this the first time, but well, that's that's where I took it from. Um, also, for this particular situation, where I kind of reduced myself to projective measurements and to 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 pure states, um, most of the definitions that are out there in literature will coincide, right? But then once you once you start uh, being 
a bit more precise and you start allowing mixed states and and um, POVMs project, uh, I mean, positive operator valid measures. I think that there are there can be a little bit of a differences when something's being self-tested by one deficient and the other one, but at least in this, in this, in this nice little box that I this little corner that I put myself into, everything should coincide. Okay. Um, okay, so Myers and Yao also gave the, the first example, right? So, so what was the first example? Well, um, the first model that, that you know, they, they noted that it's being self-tested is actually the one that, the, the, the famous one made out of Pauli measurements and maximally entangled uh, state of local dimension to the one that, the one that gives the maximum violation of, of Bell, of the Bell inequality, right? And the, the, the original Bell inequality, right? So, so it's a pretty famous measurement that, um, yeah. Um, so that was in 2004. Now, since then, I mean, that, there was a whole lot of work that's been done on self-testing, like on figuring out what can be self-tested and what not. Um, and that's because it's kind of the strongest way of device independent certification be, because i mean you, you really don't ask much right i mean you ask for no communication of devices and you ask for quantum theory to be valid and then you can deduce if you have a self-tested model you can use um the, the the correlations to deduce what's what's the model and this has been widely used right so these are probably topics that you know way more than me for me personally, it's it's uh, what, what I what I okay. Nowadays we 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 are working something on randomness generation with uh, Mate Farkas and and Laura Manchinska, um, but otherwise the, the computational complexity. So self testing appears uh, plays a role in the proof on the on the refutation of cons embedding conjecture. So you know, as a mathematician, that was such a big thing. Oh, cons embedding conjecture is false, right? So it it, it was interesting to, to to see that this also um, plays a role in this. Okay, um, now we talk about what can be self-tested. Now let me just um, make this a little bit more precise. So often one says, well, which state can be self-tested? What, what, what do people tend to think under this question is, which state can appear in a self-tested model? And similarly, which measurements can be self-tested? It, it's about which, which, which measurements appear in a in, in a self-tested model. So of course I can't self-test the state just by itself, right? I need a model around it. I need probably some additional measurements. I, I need some measurements around, right? Um, so I'll talk about these two questions. These are of course not the only <laughs> questions of relevant, and actually these two questions have been have, have many answers already. Um, but more generally, I mean you don't focus just on states and measurements, you also focus on what kind of properties can be self-tested, right? Like uh, maybe you don't really care about some particular measurements, but you care about certain property. For example, um, people study like, oh, can you detect whether or not your measurements uh, come from a sick POVM? That's not self-testing in a normal sense because sick POVMs uh, are not unique up to, I mean, there's more than one up to unitary equivalent. So you can only self-test the property of having a sick POVM. You can't really necessarily determine which one do you have, right? There, then also one thing I'm not going to talk about, and it's but on the other hand, it's very interesting also for me because I come from, maybe from non-commutative optimization perspective. Um, you can have a stronger notion of self-testing, namely, in this talk, I'm using the whole information of of of, of correlations to deduce what the measure what the model is. You could ask for less. You can simply ask for oh, what if I just know that this model is the maximal violation of some particular Bell inequality? Does that mean that this model is essentially unique? So this is what people refer to as self-testing by Bell inequality. And then the last thing that I'm also not going to talk about is robust self-testing. Now, all this, all this, you know, self-testing is, it, it looks really great on paper. I mean, for a, for a mathematician, it's exciting, right? But on practice, if you really, if you're collecting some statistics, I mean, you're never getting exact numbers. This is like, a, it's, you know, uh, depending on the on the size of the sample, but nothing's completely exact. So you want, ideally you want to have some robust self-testing. So if your correlation is almost the same, right? Then the models should be almost the same. But again, these are these are some things that I'm not going to. Okay, and now, um, 
what 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 can we self test if I talk about state? So I mean, this this was the the, the progression how things went, right? So of course they still managed to show that every entangled state, any uh, qubit state, can be self tested. Uh, in two thousand fifteen, then two years later, well, actually we can extend this to to um, to any dimension um, d. And then later on, there were even the, the, they even got results for for maximal uh, sorry for for um, multipartite states, right? For for states on, with more than two parties, so outside of the scope that I'm going to talk about, right? Um, so these were the these were the first. So so this in in a sense that's a nice you know um, in a sense this answers the question, right? I mean, which states can be tested? Well, everything can be or every entangled state can be self-tested. Um, now, of course, how can we self-tested, right? So, so in all these um, this initial results, right? They said, oh, self uh, state is self-tested if you know it 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 appears in a model that's self-tested. Now, you don't really specify how many inputs and outputs do you have in in, in this model, right? So, in all these original results, the 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 the, the 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 construction of this model was you know somehow recursive and whatnot so it was growing really a lot with with the local dimension d right the number of inputs and outputs um and in some sense that's unavoidable you cannot you cannot have fixed number of inputs and outputs that are going to work for 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 every state right that's essentially you do some dimension count um it's it's not going to work Nevertheless, for nice families of states, uh, their scope, right? And what, what I mean by a particularly nice uh, family of states, it's uh, maximal entangled states of local dimensions d, right? So maximally entangled state, I'm gonna call I'm gonna call this the maximal entangled state because up to up to unitary basis change, there's only one, um, and, and 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 that's the one, and. Um, Mathematically, I, it's, I, I like this property that oh, when you take maximum entangled state, you take this inner product that expresses as a trace of, 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 of the product. Okay, so what can we say better about maximal entangled states? Well, it started by figuring out that, well, you can, you can fix the number of inputs and then the only the output uh, goes up and and with, with dimension d and it it's not just that it goes up with the dimension d it, it it's exactly d right it's kind of a you're not you're not doing any wasteful stuff on on the number of inputs uh, on, on the number of outputs um so that was in 2019 and then in 2020 was 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 at least to my knowledge maybe the first time when both inputs number of inputs and number of outputs were fixed and that was who. So he proved that for infinitely many, even these maximal entangled state of local dimension D um, is self-tested by some uh, five input to output model. What do I mean this five input output uh, to output model? It means that both parties have five inputs and for each input you have five outputs. Um, maybe it's a weird statement for infinitely many, even these. So the, 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 in the proof, what he does is this D is actually a prime number minus one, right? So he, uh, he uses some group theoretic uh, arguments to show that for infinitely many primes, uh, one can get a self-tested model. And, and this then gives you infinitely many instances of, uh, of even these. This was then complemented more or less at the same time uh, by Manchinska, Prakash, and uh, Schaffhauser, uh, where they provided self-tests with, with four inputs and two outputs for maximal entangled states of all odd dimensions, right? So it's a really complementary result. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is, is kind of a, um, maybe maybe finishing this story here with maximum, well, uh, maybe not finishing, but but um, wrapping this up and, and showing that you can have, a, um, you, can, you can do, you can self-test every maximum entangled state, regardless even or odd uh, with four inputs and two outputs. Now the proof, the, the the proof as we'll see, it's it relies um, well. These are, it's not. It, how should I say, it? the 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 odd case D does not is not the same models as Manchinska, Praka, Schaffhauser get. That said, the 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 ideas of the proof come from Manchinska, Praka, and Schaffhauser, right? So the proof is way similar to to what they do for odd D's than than for what Fu did for for this infinitely many even these.
and I'll try to point out where where this where, where distinctions and where where similarities are in the proof. Okay, so that, that, that that's what I'll say about the the, the maximum entangled states. I'm also going to say something a little bit about measurements. Um, so with measurements, it's it's been a little less known. So, but but again, first it was shown that all 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 ensembles, all like if you if you if you give me a bunch of uh, PVMs two dimensional PVM on 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 two dimensional and real, I'm not going to go into details why why real, but uh, we can discuss that at the end. Um, so first that was shown that that can be self tested. And then the next step was well, the most popular measurements uh, on, on, on two dimensional space are the, the Pauli measurements. And then it was shown that, oh, if I take tensor product of Pauli measurements, that's also something that can be self tested. And of course, if you look back, all these all this instances when someone got an infinite family of self tests for, 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 for states of unbounded dimensions, of course, that, that also gives you some self tests for measurements, right? So these were all infinite. Uh, families of, of self-tests for measurements. And as I mentioned, what I didn't put on the slide is nowadays we can, I mean, I'm, I'm just talking about projective measurements. There's also some self-tests about non-projective measurements. With the, so people can even do that. Um, now, recently with um, Laura Manchinska and her PhD student, uh, Ren Liu Chen, uh, we show that actually, yeah, which, whichever, um, collection of, of P PDMs um, on d-dimensional space you give us, we can we can construct a self-tested model around it. Um, of course, the, the size of this model, actually, the number of inputs and outputs, I think is, I mean, outputs are always going to be two, but the inputs are approximately d squared, right? So it, it grows with, with, with d. Um, that said, if you only focus on a single measurement, and here I, I, I'll do a little bit of explanation because I want I don't want to be misleading what this statement means. But if you fix if you, if you want to certify only a single um, projective measurement, um, then you can do that with uh, with somehow really the, the smallest well not not the smallest but somehow uh, a reasonably small number of, of 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 inputs and outputs. Namely, if you have if you want to certify a k PVM, so PVM consisting of k projections. Then you need this model. So the first part it has five inputs. Most of these inputs have two outputs. The last input has k outputs, and the other part it has. Well, I wrote five inputs. I think you only need four inputs, right? That to be two outputs. Um, so what does this statement actually mean? Okay, so if I focus on on a single PDM, then up to a Local unitary basis change, uh, basis changes single p of e m equals to the following. It's it's equal uh, all the all the projections are diagonal. They are in blocks. Uh, each of them uh, has one block identity and the other blocks zero. Right up to a unitary basis change. If I don't care about other possible measurements, um, if I don't care how they look like in relation to this measurement, then I can change the basis always to 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 to, to get to get. Um, to, to take my KPDM into this form, right? So in other words, up to a local uh, unitary basis change, a single PVM is, is, is determined by, by few natural parameters, namely the dimension of the space and the ranks of the projections. Okay. So, okay, I'll, 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 I'll give proofs for this orange stuff. Now, um, what kind of a math is gonna be behind this proofs. And here I'll go a little bit more into details because I think there's more potential for, for this um, uh, than what I did with them. I think there's more potential for these results and they are also somehow mathematically appealing. Um, what's the idea? Well, self-testing, it's kind of a uniqueness result, right? When something is uniquely determined by something, right? And also, I mean, um, mathematically speaking, it's kind of a funny thing, right? I, I'm kind of a, I'm, if I just scroll back to what do I want, right? I want to determine the whole state and measurements with a little, with, with a very little data somehow, right? Just, just this, um, just this expectation values, this inner products, right? So these are, these are, if you want, bilinear expressions in projections, right? So somehow, at most that I'm, I mean, I'm kind of a hoping to use some linear relations between projections to determine what 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 the projections are. Is that uh, I mean, 
that's somehow the idea, right? That I, I want to look for projections that are determined by some linear relations. And um, this is a very natural object um, that's going to give me this kind of information. I wrote this very mathematically. So what am I saying? You fix a natural number and you fix a n plus one tuple of real numbers, uh, non-negative real numbers. And you look at the following C star algebra. I'll say first, and then I'll say what you can forget about this definition. So it's a C star algebra generated universally by n projections such that this linear combination of them is, is multiple of identity. So this, this n plus one tuple of constants appears here in this linear, um, linear combination. Now, if you don't know what C star algebra is or universal C star algebra is, don't worry, that's not the point. What we're really going to talk about in this talk is this second object representations of this algebra. So what is this? This is simply collection of all tuples of projections that satisfy this relation. This is representation, star representations of C star algebra as, as bounded operators in Hilbert spaces. Okay, these are all fancy words. Essentially, I'm looking at the collection of all n tuples of projections that satisfy this linear relation. Mathematically, can I have a question here? Yes. So, why do you assume that this this axis are projections? Because this is unclear. Uh, ah, why, why am I going to assume that these axes? No, no, I, I see the assumption here. It's x i equals x i squared. Sorry, sorry. I just oh yeah, yeah, right. So, so I want to say that yeah, that they are project <laughs> like, like they are you know square to two and they are self adjoint. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. we don't assume that they are orthogonal. Yeah. They these are not these are most likely not going to be orthogonal. Okay. Um, so so if you want how that's going to give me um, how that's going to give me my PDMs at the end. Um, if I have here n projections, I'm going to get n PVMs out of it because each projection is going to give me one, one PVM with the two outputs, right? The projection and identity uh, minus projection, that's going to be a PVM. Okay. 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 So they, um, they correspond to a single measurement. I mean, this n projections do not form a single measurement, but n measurement. No, exactly. You're right. Yes. The, this, these n projections at the end are not going to form a single measurement, but rather n measurements. Okay. At the end, what I'm actually going to specialize on is n equals four. But okay. I'm, I, I'm going to show this slightly more general because, again, I, I think this can be useful to, to, to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and these are these are funny objects, right? Like, oh, like, like mental <laughs> mental exercise. I'm, I'm saying exercise. It's not that easy. But uh, let's say that I ask myself, like, oh, what if I try to figure out um, which are, uh, do I have uh, triples of projections that add up to lambda times identity? For which lambda is this, is the answer yes or no? And it's it's not hard, but it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's elementary somehow, but it's not easy. You can show that, oh, there exists triples of projections that add up to lambda to identity, even only if lambda is either zero, one, three halves, two, or three. And this is, you know, zero, one, two, and three are okay. You can think of you can think of one-dimensional projections that give you zero, one, two, or three. But the three halves is a suspicious one, right? I mean, how do you get three halves? But you can do that. You can you can you can do two by two projections that are going to add up to three halves times identity. And there's a whole school of math. Um, most of them uh, most of them are from Ukraine. So in my mind, I always call them Ukrainian school of functional analysis. So Samoylenko, Krulia, Karabanovich, and, and, and others. So there was a whole body of work from 2000 to, let's say, 2007, 2010, when they were studying questions like, oh, for which numbers, natural numbers n, and for each tuples alphas, do these objects even exist? Like, can you find some, you know, projections that will satisfy these equations. And for example, also how do, this, uh, how do they look like? Are they highly unique or not so unique? What are they made of? What are the building blocks and so on? Um, so that's what we're gonna use. We're kind of gonna use their techniques, not their results because they were not posing questions about self-testing, but the, their techniques, their intermediate results are what, what are gonna be useful for us. Um, and you see in this exercise, as I said, it's 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 not easy to figure out, you know, if I just give you some alphas to figure out what, how do these things look like. But that's the point. We don't really need to think to just about any alphas. We'll actually fo focus on some particular values of alphas at the end, and for those, we'll, we'll have a good answer. Um, 
can I have another question to the previous slide? Yes. Why you why you impose that the uh, uh, this this linear combination of projections uh, equals I mean it's proportional to one? So, yeah. <clears throat> the the short answer is because that's going to work well for us. <laughs> that that's going to work well for us. Um, you can you can think about it that if if let's say that for some values of alpha, I know that oh there are essentially unique projections that do this. Then this is kind of a handy for self testing because if some projections are 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 kind of a uniquely determined by linear relations, linear relations is something that I have a bit of a hope to capture with correlations. Mm -hmm. That's why this is a good object for us to look at. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, but so uh, okay, I understand what you are saying. But usually, when you think of self testing, you try to kind of you you have you first have some ideal scenario where you where you know the state and the measurements that allow you to self test, and so like you reverse engineer your self testing approach or scheme. Yes. So, uh, so I guess that if you wanted to self test the maximal angle state by using like a finite number of measurements with finite number of outcomes. You, you knew from the beginning that there, there is a set of uh, projective measurements that like whose projections sum up to their identity. Mm -hmm. Is it true? I mean, this is how you kind of... Uh... So, so may, yeah, maybe, I mean, the, the way how, I mean, again, the, 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 in the talk I'll talking, I, I'm talking about self-testing by correlations, but a, a natural way to come up with this kind of stuff is to think about actually about Bell inequalities, right? Because you say, oh, if I have a maximal violation of a Bell inequality, that that gives me some you know sums of squares proof and then each of those sums of squares gives me a relation right and then you can actually sh so if at some point i was doing by hand calculation like what are the simplest kind of a sums of squares proofs that i can get up if i want to self-test some state and it turns out that could you is there any hope to self-test with sums of squares where the where the terms are linear um, to, to get a self-test, and it turns out that the most that you can self-test with this is maximally entangled states. If you want to have the simplest possible sums of squares proofs, it, it, you, you can, you, the linear ones, you can only get some uh, um, the, 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 the maximal entangled states. So that's why the linear sums of squares, that, that, that's why the linear relations are the best. But yeah, on the other hand, it's, okay, how do I know that out of this am I going to get a self-test for maximal entangled state? You can say that you, you'll see that the way how I'm going to make the model, it's going to be highly symmetric, or rather what, um, um, right, it's going to be, I'm going to take the same the same projections on, on both sides. Um, that's not, that's a little bit of a heuristic argument, but this usually leads to that if it will self-test something, if it will self-test something, it's going to be maximally entangled state because of the symmetry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, the main tool that we're gonna that we're gonna get from these mathematicians is the following. Um, I'm calling these things functors. You can just think of maps. So what did they do? They managed to find some maps from from tuples of projections that satisfy the linear relation with these coefficients to tuples of projections that satisfy linear combination with some other coefficients. So they found two maps like this, and these two maps are invertible maps. Uh, actually, they square to identity. If you do one twice, you get back to the same thing. What's the idea here? The idea here is that if I understand projections that satisfy this relation, and if I have bijection from to some to some other parameters, then if I understand one, I also understand the other one. So the idea is that maybe we only need to to know you know some initial case some 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 uh, the the behavior for some initial values of alpha zero alpha n and then maybe we can start combining these maps and we 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 get knowledge also about um, you know how these projections look like that satisfy some other 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 um, other 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 linear relations. I'm going to show you one of this map one of these maps because it's 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 easy. It's the map T. What the, what what's the observation? You say that oh, if I have projections x one to x n that satisfy this linear relation, the first one, then if I then if I look at the projections identity minus x j, then they satisfy this relation, right? 
So you, you see that the first equation implies the second equation. So what does this tell me? That tells me that if my X satisfies some relation, then identity minus X is going to satisfy this other relation. So that gives me that gives me a map from one collection of these tuples satisfying the relation to, to tuples of satisfying another relation. So that's T. S is going to be a little bit more complicated, and I'm actually going to skip it. Um, but it's also something very constructive. Now, the thing is, just this T and S by themselves, they won't do much because if I do T twice, I just end up with the same thing. If I do S twice, I just end up to the same thing. But then the funny thing is, if you start doing them, you know, one, one T, one S, one T, one S, and so on. So if I look at the composition, it gives me something weird. It says that, oh, I, I, get, I, I get a map from tuple satisfying linear combination with these relations to tuples that satisfy some weird, some weird linear relation with these coefficients, right? So somehow it gives me, I can, I can get from some information about one tuples to another tuples if I'm using this one. The, the index notation here looks terrible now, so I'm going to specialize on what I really care about. I'm only going to look in the case where all the coefficients are one and just the non-one non coefficient is in, in front of the scalar. So I'm simply talking about quadruples of projections that add up to lambda times one. So what they did is they showed us, they showed that there are maps from, 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 um, from tuple quadruples adding to lambda to tuples adding to four minus lambda. And there are, there's a map from tuples adding to lambda to tuples adding to this funny looking fractions. So that's what they did. And what can I do now with this? I start with a very easy case. I first look at two values, lambda equals zero or one. These are easy, right? Because if I say, what are quadruples adding to zero? Two quadruple of projections adding to zero. Well, there's not many options, right? They, all the projections need to be zero. So essentially, there's just one, one building block, namely quadruple of zeros. On the other hand, if I put lambda equals to one, then I'm asking, oh, what's a quadruple adding to one? Well, that's a PDM. And um, well, they, they, are actually, they are actually built out of four, four types. Either you take one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero. So you have four, four options and then you build them into direct, direct sums. So there's four, four building blocks. And these are two easy things. Now, if I use those maps that they made, then suddenly I get this weird information that, oh, actually, because those were bijection, that also tells me that um, P four thirds also has exactly one irreducible uh, one one building block because I get it from P zero. Those two ma those maps magical maps that I showed well that I didn't show but I, I mentioned that they exist. They take me from P zero to P four thirds. So I get for free information that because P zero had just one block. Now I also know that P four thirds has just one block. And similarly, if I do this to P1, I get, if I look at those formulas before, that gives me information about P3 halves. Because P1 had only four blocks, P3 halves only has four blocks. And then you start playing this game again, again, and repeated and repeated. And you get this, this information. You find out that for, that for all odd values of D, the, the, the value of the parameter lambda equals two minus two D is gonna have exactly one building block. And for the values of two minus one D where D is any number, you get exactly four building blocks. So you start with very simple lambdas and then you use those maps to get information about other lambdas. Why did I mention these two families? These are maybe, um, because I get them from these two basic cases, zero and one. Now, this one that gives you all the odd Ds, this is what Manchinska uh, and colleagues used for their self-test of maximal entangled state of odd dimension. You see the appeal here. The appeal is that you know that you have only one building block. And this having some uniqueness is really what plays well with self-testing, right? On the other hand, if you take this other family, you get any dimension, any D, not just odd D. However, the, the price is that you don't have uniqueness anymore. 
but it's not too bad. You have control. You know that there's only four different building blocks that you need to juggle about. Right. So somehow the first the first case this uniqueness of of building blocks is is somehow what's maybe more appealing from self testing point of view. The second one says you don't have uniqueness. You have four different things. But you know, you still kind of you have control if if you look at what those maps do, how I got to here. Um, okay, and I didn't realize I'm gonna be so slow. But anyway, let me just show you how how these maps look like for for this second family. Um, so for the dimension d equals uh, one, two, three, four, you can you can I mean those maps s and t. Um, they I didn't give you formulas, but they are not they are not terrible. You can implement them. You can you can compute things, right? It's not it's not it's not an abstract nonsense. Okay, so you get some some something some, thing, some uh, tuples of projections like this, and then um, what 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 was the highlight? What was the point of those irreducible representations? Well, when I say irreducible representation, that is what I would call a building block. You know that what's the dimension. You can figure out when you look at the maps. You can figure out what are the ranks of this of the projections that happen there. Um, you can figure out something about eigenvectors of some expressions in the, in these in these projections. Namely, um, if I if I take if I take this kinds of a tensor tensor uh, combination of them, you can figure out that oh um, if if I take x one tensor x one plus x two tensor x two plus x three tensor x three with these projections. The, the 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 eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue is going to be exactly the maximal entangled state, and this this is somehow we start seeing that oh that's how I'm going to get to self testing right this tells me this tensor combination this is something that I see in correlations, and and now I'm identifying maximal entangled state as a largest eigenvector for for this combination right so that's 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 how we're getting closer to 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 it, and you can even figure some weird spectral thing like. Even though those projections, I can only get recursive formula, I can get some very definite answers about these projections. Namely, if you add two of them, you get a Hermitian matrix that has distinct eigenvalues, which is which is a non trivial thing, right? Okay, I have two projections. Do I, I mean, how do I know the sum, how many distinct eigenvalues is gonna have? You can you can analyze this kind of stuff if you if you look at those formulas for, for the maps S and T. Um, and I'm mentioning that because this is going to be important at some point, that the sum of two of those projections has eigenvalues. Okay. So th this is this is essentially, fun you're, you're doing some functional analysis, or let's say you're doing linear algebra, essentially, right? And, and you figure out some stuff. So can I have a question concerning these presentations? Yes. So this excess, I mean, uh, can it happen that for some dimension they are orthogonal to each other? No, it can't. Because if they were, you could somehow... Reduce the number of measurements and increase the number of outcomes. Maybe no. Yes, you're right, but <laughs> the, the they are they they don't get. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and then the other question is so so you you have like this representation for when you have four projections, but what about like three projections? Why they don't exist? Okay, so why why I didn't do three projections? Let, let me jump back. In three projections, you, you really see that you can with three three projections are kind of a um, they don't give you too much essentially. You can you can show that it can only cover the the building blocks are going to be one times one or two by two. You're not going to have arbitrary high dimensions. So going to four four projections adding to multiple of identity is the first time when you can cover all the dimensions. You can also then take five and then it's you know you, you get even more. But four is the first time when you can when you can hope with this particular um, algebra to to cover all the dimensions. Okay, and could it be that like if you have five or six projections or something like this, then they start to be orthogonal to each other? Yes, it could be. I, I think, okay, so again, that, that's why maybe I show this whole thing. So you see, at the end, I'm using this all the coefficients set to one and then multiple of identity. I think once you start varying the, the, the coefficients, mm -hmm. you can, you could, I think you could do this kind of stuff, what you're talking about, that you can enforce some of them to be orthogonal to some of them and so on. So I, I think you can start getting more more rich things. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So maybe for maximal entangled state, this is now the strategy. How do you get a, a self-testing strategy uh, model for for d-dimensional maximal entangled state? You take a 
uh, building block for, for, for this parameter lambda equals two minus one over D. And this is your model. You take the state. These are uh, projective measurements for the first part. These are projection, projective measurements for the second part. And now just like uh, what, what somehow, what's, what's, what are the main steps of the proof? Um, Let's say that you have another model that has the same correlations. There are now three main steps. First of all, you show that um, you show this synchronicity property. Namely, you show that this model, this unknown model, uh, when I do measurement uh, just of the first one times identity on the state, that's the same as identity times the the, the same ith measurement on the on the party B, right? So so. That this is some, I mean, you could call, I don't know, I've seen this called synchronicity property. So maybe that, that's the first thing that you get. Um, and that's essentially because the mu tilde has this property. It's because I'm using here, uh, I, I'm using here um, the, the, same, the same measurements on both parties. That kind of helps you establish this property. How to get this property? It's essentially cauchy schwarz inequality. It's nothing very deep, but I'm going to skip it. So this is really just the basic linear algebra to get this. The second thing is you identify the measurements because once you have the synchronicity property, then you see I can get that this particular inner product, I can replace one co copies of PIs with QIs. And now this right-hand equation, right-hand expression, this is this is made out of correlations, right? This is this is um, linear in Ps and linear in Qs. This is something, this is a linear combination of numbers coming from correlation. And because mu tilde satisfies these equations, namely that this is equal to zero, that tells me that now this square is equal to zero. What does that tell you? That tells you that the p's on the psi, they behave like a representation of, of this algebra. So that imposes the, 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 that imposes the, the, the relations on how projections look like. And then you say, okay, my projections look like a representation of this algebra on this state. So, okay, now I know that there's four building blocks. I know how, how they look like and so on. And, and then finally, um, you can prove that, okay, once you know how, once you know what are the, 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 the measurements need to satisfy these relations, then you can prove that, well, the state is then the eigenvalue, eigenvector for this particular tensor product. And then you again use that, oh, I already know what's the biggest eigenvalue for the tensor product of Xi. So you, you determine state at the end, right? But that's somehow the idea. And that, that's, that's where you see that, oh, having linear relations on having some projections with, with linear relations, that's really something that's, that's, that's nice to deduce out of, out of, out of correlations. Okay. That's one thing that was, that was getting the state in. Um, and now, okay, now I want to also certify some additional measurement. Uh, I, I said, okay, I can self-test single single measurement. And and the idea here is going to be, okay, let me just check how I'm like doing the time. Okay, yeah, I'll wrap this up in, in two slides. So the idea of this is called post hoc self-testing. So this was, I think this was first time implicitly used in 2016. And then really in words, it was defined in 2020, at least as far as I know. And the question is simple. I have a self-tested model. Someone gives you a self-tested model. Let's say, and now you take another measurement, let's say on party B side, can you add it to your model and hope that the whole thing is still self-tested? It's a natural question, right? When, when, can, you, when can you keep enlarging your model and, and hopefully everything stays self-tested? Um, we're gonna use that. So um, with Chen and, and, and Laura, we, we, got, we got this criterion, a uh, sufficient criterion. It tells, you, it tells you when you can add something. It's 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 a it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's essentially linear linear algebra. What does it say? Let's say that I have a self-tested model and I have some other PVM that now I wonder, can I add it to 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 on one side and the whole thing stays self-tested? And the theorem says yes if the following is true. If you can find some h in the span of the measurements of, of the first party, and then what do you do? You, you look at that h, it's a Hermitian matrix. Um you look at you look at, uh, at at its eigenvalues. You divide eigenvalues in, in in groups, and then you look at the corresponding eigenspaces. Now, if your if your new project PVM that you're adding, if these are exactly projections onto the the the, the eigenspaces, then you win. 
then, then you can do that. So what's the point of this theorem? It's If you give me a, a PVM, this Q hat, and you ask me, oh, can I add it? It's actually hard to answer for me. On the other hand, what's easy for me is to give you many, many new PVMs that I can extend with. Namely, I just take, a, I can take any linear combination of P's of, of, the, of the measurements of the first party. I find its eigenvalues, eigenspaces, and if I took the, the projections onto those eigenspaces that I, I say, I can give you, tell you then, oh, well, now this is a new PVM that you can add to it. Right? So, so it's, it doesn't look, I mean, it's, it's good if you want to produce new measurements that you want to add to it. It's not really good if you give me a measurement and you ask me, can I add it? Um, okay, but what's the point of this theorem? Well, now I can claim that over every KPVM appears in a self-tested model with, with, with this number of inputs and outputs. In particular, right, if I, if I, the main case is actually K equals two binary PVM. Now binary PVM with two outputs is just determined by a projection and identity minus projection. So up to unitary basis change is determined by two numbers, right? By the dimension and by the rank of that projection. So essentially what, what this corollary says, it says nothing more, nothing less than for any pair of parameters, R and D, natural parameters, you can, you can make a self-tested model with this constant number of inputs and outputs that's gonna have a measurement with these two parameters. And um, what's the idea? Well, I'm gonna take the, the self-test I had before for maximal entangled state and I'm gonna extend it. Why can I extend it? Well, before I said that, that funny, uh, the, the, those representations, they have the property that when I add two of them, I get a matrix with pairwise distinct eigenvalues. If I have pairwise distinct eigenvalues, I can model any rank with them, right? I can, I can if I have distinct eigenvalues, I can divide them in two sets, one that has uh, any size that I choose and, and the complement of it, right? And then I take a projection on these eigenspaces and the complement of it. And that gives me a PVM and I can get any possible rank because they had all distinct eigenvalues. Right? That's somehow the point why, why I was doing the eigenvalues thing, why, why I needed that information. Right? Um, so kind of, a, you need this post hoc self-testing extension and, and you need this thing that you, you, have, a, you, you, you have a control about uh, over your representation. So, I'm sorry, I, I didn't plan to run, run so 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 close to the time, but somehow the, the, the takeaway was the takeaway. Okay, I mean, we can now have some constant size self-tests for some particular infinite families, more that more that we knew before, but there were already things known before me. Um, projections adding to a scalar, I find them really fun. I think it's a fascinating math because it was also surprising for me to see this kind of stuff. It's just, it's a magical thing that you, you have these maps between them um, that, that you can then get information for different values of, of the scalar. Um, what I don't know is, can I actually do these things with bell inequalities instead of correlations? I have some ideas, but I also have some ideas why this could not work. Again, bell inequalities heuristically really well play whenever you have uh, really kind of a uniqueness of representation behind. And here I don't quite have a uniqueness. I have at least four, I have four representations running around. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying I did try. It didn't, it didn't quite work yet. And the, the last thing that I want to say is linear combination of projections. So, so adding, varying all those coefficients a bit more. I think one can get more of this, right? Because um, I said, oh, I can certify a single, a single PVM. Okay, that's not much. I would hope that maybe one can go and try, you know, certifying um, pairs of binary measurements. Now, pairs of binary measurements, um, projective measurements, that's still something that's tractable because I know that up to up to unitary basis change, two PVMs at the same time uh, are described by well by finitely many continuous parameters, right? So I would imagine that if I bound the number of continuous parameters, I can find. Uh, self-test that is constant uh, for for each for each fixed number of, of of those parameters, right? Because binary pairs of binary PVMs that's essentially what it's talking about pairs of space of subspaces in a in a Hilbert space, and they are kind of a up to basis change. They are determined by something that we call principal angles between between them, right? So it's still kind of a tractable thing to 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 track down um, two of them. So, so that's why I'm. That, that's maybe one application. I'm. I'm I, I, there might be more stuff that you can do with with varying those coefficients. You can get a big, big variety of things that you can understand. 
Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Yuri, for this very, very cool seminar. Uh, now we can ask the audience if they have questions. Well, I have some questions, but maybe so the other um, people in the audience would like to ask something. So. Yeah, uh, I can start with, oh, yeah. There I am. Hello. Uh, I have a question kind of connected to what Remik asked before, but why C, C star algebra? Because I can see this whenever I, I see a, like a highly mathematical paper on like quantum mechanics, it's always this construction. Can you give me some intuition? Because I, I, I heard like a definition of this object some years ago, but I don't quite understand why it appears constantly. Okay, so let me start with what would we otherwise do? So what are the usual constructions how to get self-testing, right? Often it, it reduces something, it goes to, you know, um, oh, there's an underlying group that does something, right? Okay, so why would we usually do that? Well, group representations are the most well-known things that we have. The mathematicians, they know the most about them, right? They can classify them, how they look like, how, how many they are, right? So, so that's why that, that would be a go-to thing, right? That said, the, the group, right, to encode the group, you know, the, the group the, the, the group relations, they, they have high powers in it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why even when you look at the, the, the proof of why the, you know, uh, the original proof for self-testing uh, qubit maximal entangled state, um, well, the proofs that I've seen, they, they usually, you know, they find that, oh, the underlying, uh, the, 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 the measurements, the, 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 the underlying group is Heisenberg group, and then, you know, representations of Heisenberg group, and then you throw some of them out and so on. But even Heisenberg group, it's defined by nonlinear relations, right? It's defined by, oh, anti-commutators equal to zero and stuff like that, right? Okay. So anti-commutators are not, anti-commutators are not too bad because it's a quadratic relation. Um, but then as soon as you, you try to do something complicated, well, you need to get higher relations and it's not impossible as we see, because I mean, that's, that's how many, many self-tested proofs were done, especially when you start thinking about in terms of observables, when you, instead of talking about one, a PVM, you talk about a unitary that adds, a, that, uh, that has finite order or something like that. So that looks more group-like, but still like detecting those higher relations it's hard. It's really like looking, looking for a pin in, in, in a grass, right? You need yeah. to be lucky. Like it's, it's hard to build a consistent theory out of this, right? And then when, uh, and then when, um, then when, when people maybe more from functional analysis that were familiar with this particular body of work from, um, from, from this, in my mind, Ukrainian school of functional analysis, they notice, oh, but these are linear relations, right? That's, that's somehow, the, the most, I mean, that, that's somehow the natural thing to expect when you're looking at expectations. That's also, I mean, for me, somehow, you, you know, I, I, I come a little bit from optimization case. And, and in optimization, you do, do, you do with some stuff that's called a moment problem. What's a moment problem essentially tells you that, oh, I want to deduce a random variable, right? And let's say that I'm given the moments of, of a random variable, expectation and then variance and, you know, higher moments. And typically the mathematical answer is, oh, if you know all the moments, you know the variable, right? <laughs> Which, you know, sometimes it's true, sometimes not, but you know, we like to know all the moments. So when a mathematician starts to look at, at, at this quantum stuff and you're, you're saying, oh my God, they only know the expectations, right? How am I gonna deduce anything out of this? It's scary, right? So that's why you first think of, okay, I only have linear moments. So I'm only gonna, I should really focus on objects that, they, that are determined by linear relations. Okay, so in that sense, like C star algebra is kind of like the one of one of the most general in a sense. Well, I, I would say that's that why I'm using the C star. That, yeah. That's why I'm using the C star algebra given by linear relations. Now, yeah. in general, what I would say is whenever, whenever, especially self tests coming from bell inequalities, right? I say, oh, bell inequality maximum violation is you know this, and then I say, okay, the difference of these two is non-negative, so I can write it as a sum of squares. And then equality is deter is is called whenever those square all of those yeah. squares are zero. Square being zero means that that well it gives you a relation, right? Uh -huh. So that's why people yeah. said, okay, now I know that my projections satisfy this relation. 
And then when you say, okay, when I think of all projections satisfying the same type of relations, that's what we call a universal sister algebra. That's what I call oh, okay. universal sister algebra of projections satisfying some relations. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I think I get it. Okay, so for me, system algebra, it's again, it's really just a fancy question, a fancy, fancy language to think of the collection of all projections satisfying certain relations. Now, in this talk, I'm saying the relations that are maybe the most amenable for, for self testing are the linear relations because mm. they, 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 they yeah. somehow, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Okay, Mick. Okay, so maybe. Uh... So I would first ask about the value inequality because you, you said that you have some uh, arguments for not being able to derive a value inequality based on the self-testing, your self-testing. So what was, so I, <clears throat> I can understand, I mean, I mean, if you can self-test a state and, and measurements, then, I mean, it means that there must be some locality. I mean, the, the yes. should, so there must be some value inequality that detects it. Yes. So can you say again, what was the, the problem with the writing of an inequality based on this? Okay, yeah, so um, I'll show you, I, I'll, I'll give you an indication of what I think should be, you know, what should be the Bell inequality, what, what I would take. I will, so on this page, this the middle inequality here that I'm scrolling mm -hmm. over, I would take this term with a minus, and mm -hmm. then plus um, huge numbers that will, that uh, huge, huge terms that will impose synchronicity. Somehow the idea would be that, uh, you know, like, like this, I mean, if, if things are non-synchronous, then this, this, this expression here can be, you know, positive or negative, doesn't tell me much. But if, if you can enforce through Bell inequality, if you have some big terms that, are, that can enforce synchronicity, then you can make that this always needs to be non-negative. And then you can say, okay, if, I, if, if somehow I can, I can force it, I can say, oh, in maximal case, it needs to be equal to zero, right? <laughs> Now, this idea that you can enforce synchronicity in, 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 in a Bell inequality, that's not new and that was successfully done. So that part still looks fine to me. Now, the thing is, if I do, if I, if I manage to somehow enforce in, in Bell inequality, it's gonna enforce synchronicity and enforce this relation. I'm very close to, to, to the answer. The, well, again, I didn't do that yet, but I, 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 if one could do that, then the only problem is that Okay, I still don't know that my how my projections are actually built because there's four building blocks. How do I detect that it's one of them? You see, when I'm doing it with correlations, the fact that I have the whole correlation table, I can actually figure out which exactly which of the of the of the four is, and that that I get from some from looking at specific entries of the correlation, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the question is, can you also somehow you know encode those uh, you know add those entries in the in the in the in the Bell inequality and you know for simultaneously that when you have the maximal violation all these three components are going to go to zero mm -hmm. yeah well, but in principle in like for some finite I mean, small d's you could use linear program no, for the correlations that you absolutely yeah absolutely I, I didn't do that yet but you're right i mean i, I can you, you know for for the for no, not even for small d. I think you, you see the good thing is oh the number of inputs and outputs is fixed, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, so yeah, so okay. as as far as I'm gonna I'm gonna once I change d the the, the complexity of of the linear or semi-definite program it's not gonna change the only only the only thing is gonna change is the parameters, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I should definitely check that. Yes, and as you said, like oh it's a it's a I mean. Not just that it's non-locality, right? You, I, I think there's a. I mean, we don't re, uh, we, we we strongly believe that if you have a self-testing result, then it means that it lies on the on the boundary of of the correlation set. This thing, right? So, okay, if it's on the boundary, it's not quite given, but it's. I mean, it's a good. I mean, most of the boundary point. Well, most of the boundary points are exposed points, right? So yes, you're right. I should I should be able to find yeah. a linear functional that's going to do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, can I have another question? Sure. So, uh, so, uh, so here, like, so it seems that the so I mean, in your self testing, you use this relation that the that the projections sum up to the identity, or I mean, this, their sum is uh, so it's it's the the second condition, no? Yes. So I'm asking because I was thinking that like, is it so if you already so I mean, if you removed one measurement, what would change in this? Uh, what would change here? 
Because for instance, if you have a uh, if you have a the synchronicity relation, it, it's I guess so. Like when I was working on self testing, I mean, you cited one of my papers here. So if you have uh, the synchronicity relation for like two measurements that are uh, somehow incompatible. Mm -hmm. Then you can fix the state. You can prove that the state must be up to local unit operations. It must be the uh -huh. state. Okay. So why you need these four measurements? Why you cannot like why you three are not enough? Yeah. So, or in other words, how you use this relation that they sum up to identity? Where, where it comes into to play when you want to prove self testing? So, yeah. Okay. So so I mean. You see this, I mean, the, the, the fact that I know that they are, they are projections and they satisfy that, that these are the correlations. So looking at the correlation tells me that this expression is zero. And on the other hand, this expression is equal to that. So this can be zero it tells me, okay, they satisfy these relations. Mm -hmm. If I would have only three of these measurements. They would have satisfied, yes, exactly. Yes, but I, well, I, I wouldn't know that, I, I mean, I wouldn't know that, I would know that Two two minus one over d minus three measurements uh, is well. But is it relevant? Which like so I, I understand that there would be a problem of uh, distinguishing different three, uh, sets of three of three projections or something. But is it really relevant whether like you know which three projections you have? Mm, wait, so, sorry. Okay, let let me try to formulate this this correctly. So you would like to just use three projections, right? Well, to lower the number of measurements, no? Because it's like... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, I understand. Mm -hmm. Now, if you give me... Now, from correlations, I can detect if these three measurements would add to scalar multiple of identity. But from three measurements and from, their, from the correlations, I could not detect if there's... If there, if there's another projections that when I add them to them, I get a scalar multiple of identity. So what am I saying? I could, if I either, either I mean, I, I, I see here two things. Either I can use, um, I can I can really start, I, I, I either I try to use the fact that I have three projections that add up to scalar multiple of identity. And then I'm in this case where I, where I said, oh, you can't get too many dimensions. You can only cover dimensions one and two. But the, the property that having, having three projections such that there exists a fourth projections that they four add to identity this this property i don't i don't see how to see that from correlations how to see from correlations that to recognize that given three projections there's a fourth one that they add up to multiple of identity okay i think i understand because so in the end you so you want to prove that you have like four projections that adapt to identity then you can use the representation theory to, to say yes mm -hmm. okay, okay. yeah Okay, and, and maybe the last question. So, uh, because because I was thinking of like, so here you have to use, so you, here you use the synchronicity relation for the state, and yes. you know uh, that the maximum entangled state is satisfied for any, well, for any unitary observable. Yes. Uh, so, well, I or we were thinking of like generalizing this result to, for instance, graph states, the, the multipartite graph states, and for them, you also have this type of relations, but for specific um, observables. Mm -hmm. So the question is whether you can adapt your scheme to to this type of states. Huh. Mm, um, so for instance, if you look, if you think of the maximally entangled state of two qubits, the yeah. relations are z times z, the, the Pauli matrices, z times z on psi class equals psi class, and the same for x times x. Mm -hmm. And this generalizes to, to 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 the graph states, this type of relations, but you don't have any other relations like this for any mm -hmm. other. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But since since you're already asking about the, the the state, so okay. The other thing was also you see if I if I if I'm I mean um, if I'm persisting with, with what I have here and now I say okay instead of you know quadruples adding to multiple of identity I start taking other linear combinations. If I if I keep forming my model like this, if I keep sticking mm -hmm. with synchronicity, I'm not going to get any other state, right? I mean, I'm, I'm always kind of uh, probably going to end up with the state. Now, mm -hmm. on the other hand, so so I mean, as, uh, I, I will have to. On the other hand, if I start mixing, um, you know, here the, the the measurements that I took for the other party are the same as the for the first party. If you start mixing them, mm -hmm. um, what what you can what what you can figure out is that um, 
Well, um, these things here, right? Um, sometimes, um, if you if you have linear combinations here, you can get maxi largest eigenvalues for for some other assortment, not for using x one tensor x one plus x two tensor x two, but you can get x one tensor x x two and x plus x three x two. So you start mixing them, you can get maximums. At, at, for, for different mixes, different permutations, and those maximums will typically appear for states that are not maximally entangled. So I'm saying that if I if I start using linear combinations here, um, I can get some some other states that are not maximally entangled. But but you're saying that in, uh, but like even in the bipartite case, you could get like a self-testing statement for for non-maximally entangled states. Yes, the thing is. I so so the, but the synchronicity doesn't work, no? Yes, the synchronicity doesn't work. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the thing is you can still you can still identify the the the, the what projections are and that that kind of uh, helps you. But the, the thing is when, when I was doing that, when I was varying, it's not like I got some you know well-known family of, of, of states. It's just okay, I computed it and okay, it didn't it was not maximal entangled, but it I, I couldn't really wrap my head around is is it like a significant family or what it is or i mean it, it was also i mean it was simply on numbers it's not like i got a nicely analytically closed parametric expression for what am i getting but the problem is that for the for the graph states you would need uh that the projections are like form specific uh observables like uh, you know power matrices for instance mm -hmm. and i guess here the the projections like i mean you, you showed the explicit forms of those projections yeah Dimension two, it, and they don't look like. Um, I don't know. Maybe you can bring them to X and Z or something. But yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. These projections, they don't. I mean, yeah. I I don't see if they. You know, I don't even see if they have a. You know, okay. They they they, they, they express nicely in terms of, of you know Pauli matrices and or or even you know um, the the Gelman matrices in higher dimensions. So it's it's yeah they don't they don't really look like very connected to those yes mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay thank you but i should i should point out i mean i didn't show before but the the way how you get these projections it's really a linear algebra you're doing you know svd singular value decomposition it's 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 things that you can really encode it's 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 not a complicated thing to run them essentially you're writing down some so you're you're factorizing some projection as as you know project isometries or something like that. So you can the good thing is you, you can actually you know go and compute as many as you want. It's not it's not a, it's not an abstract thing somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so well we passed a little bit of the time, but uh, I think that it yeah, that sorry was, about that. No, no, that was not a problem. It was uh, worth it. Yeah, it was a very nice uh, talk. I think we can finish for today. Uh, so thank you very much, Yuri, for accepting our invitation. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thanks and for having me. Thanks for all the questions. And see you next time. Thank you. See you. It was Bye. nice meeting you all. Take care. See you.